Hello, welcome to Raymond Castile's Basement of Horror. Happy Thanksgiving. We've never done a clip show, and this isn't exactly a clip show, but it's close. I wanted to give you something to chew on for Thanksgiving. But uh, I have a full episode scheduled for this Saturday. I didn't want to... I wanted to have a Saturday episode for you, so I didn't want to move that up to Thursday. But I wanted you to have something on Thanksgiving. So what I decided to do was show you uh, two segments from past episodes that you might not have seen. At the end of each season, I have what I call the exciting season finale, which is sort of tongue-in-cheek. It's usually something very personal, and it's a little off-topic from what we normally cover, and it's maybe a little long and ponderous. Well, every episode is long and ponderous, but the season finales are especially long and ponderous. And at least for the last two seasons, I've put a little surprise at the end of each season finale. So that the people, well, it's my thank you to the people who have stuck it out and, and stayed with the episode for two hours or three hours or however long it is. When they finally get to the end, there's like a little surprise. Uh, something that uh, is like a reward for watching the entire episode and if you're if you didn't watch those episodes and if you didn't stay with it to the end you wouldn't see the surprise so what I'm going to do since I, I, I by this point the last two season finales I mean yeah it's kind of a spoiler but for the most part whoever's going to watch those episodes has already watched them so I'm going to spoil the surprise in both those episodes and show you just the end. Now, the first one's very short. I think it's just a minute or two. Then the next one's going to be longer. I don't remember exactly how long, maybe 15, 20 minutes, something like that. But they're both the, the end surprise at the end of the episode. This first one is from last year's season finale, which was about Coffin Joe. I spent two and a half hours talking about Coffin Joe, my connection with Coffin Joe, my experience working with Coffin Joe and Coffin Joe fandom, and showing my Coffin Joe collection. Had a lot of memorabilia. It was a pretty involved episode. And I can understand why not everyone would have been able to last all the way to the end of the episode. But for those who did, I had a little surprise. I need to set this up. Uh, I started last season with COVID. I had COVID when I started the season, and I said so on the air. And the first episode was uh, kind of a sketch uh, where I, I had this giant COVID monster, this giant virus, and I, I had a weird interview, a conversation with this COVID monster. It was different from the usual episode. And then I made that a running gag in the second half of the season. These COVID monsters would start appearing over my shoulder and I'd turn around and say, what? What's that? And they'd, be, they'd disappear as soon as I turned around. And I'd say, well, did you see something? And I kept doing that because I knew where I was going with that. That set the stage for the final episode, even though it was about Coffin Joe, which has nothing to do with, with uh, COVID viruses. During that episode, these COVID monsters, they were, it was, it's a cloth puppet that I treated with uh, digital effects to make it look like it was expanding, contracting. These COVID monsters would appear behind me as I was doing the Coffin Joe episode, and I turn around like, what was that? Did you see that? And this led to the end, 
which you're about to see, I'm, I'm, I'm built up to a, an emotional ending because I'm, I mean, I knew Mujica, who, the man who plays Coffin Joe, and I talk about his death and what that meant to me. So it's a very serious ending. And then these COVID monsters appear. And you're going to see that ending right now. I guess it's time to wrap it up. What's this? Okay. You see that, right? Okay, it's gone. Where'd it go? There, right there. Okay, what the heck is this? I'm trying to do something serious, and and we have this going on. What the heck? Oh, give me a break. Is this for real? Oh, okay, what? Is this a joke or what? Come on, stop this. Hey, hey, hey cut the heck. Stop it. What? What the heck? I, I'm not doing this. What is this? Get away! Hey. Get away! Get away! Get away! Hey, get away! Você, você, o todos, vocês. Obrigado. I hope you enjoyed that. That, you'd be surprised how long it took to make just that little snippet. It took about a month to prepare everything and shoot everything and edit everything. It was ridiculous. The, 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 the upload date for that episode was delayed considerably while I worked on that ending. I'm not going to do that again. That was a little, perhaps that was a little bit overboard in terms of how elaborate it was and all the effects and everything. Uh, but it, I mean, I, I, I'm glad I did it. It was fun to do. It was fun to be Coffin Joe again. And so it was, it was cathartic for me. Uh, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds about what, what I was getting at, but I, I had I had subtext in mind as I was shooting that and editing that about what that all represented. Uh, I think people got it just from the response. I think people, if they didn't get it intellectually, I think emotionally they got it. It was all about catharsis. Um, so I think I succeeded in what I was trying to do. <sighs> this next one now is from the, so the, the Coffin Joe one was from the season five finale. I should have mentioned what, what numeric season it was. Now this next one is from the season four finale. So two years ago, I talked about Egypt. I'm Egyptian and uh, my experiences visiting Egypt and my, my family in Egypt and how I collect kitschy Egyptian mummy souvenirs. So I showed all of my Egyptian souvenir mummy items and talked about shopping in Khal Khalili and the Cairo Museum in their gift shop and buying these goofy mummies that I like. But it was a personal thing about my heritage and my childhood, uh, my mom who has passed away 
So there was a lot of personal stuff there. And it was just like the Coffin Joe one, it was, it was long. So after two hours of that, I thought people needed a reward for sticking with it. And I brought out a surprise guest, not a person, but a toy, a very, very rare, sought after, viable, but not very old toy. It's a Halloween motionette from the 90s. And it's probably the most sought after, not probably, I, I, I think it's safe to say it's the most sought after motionette in existence. Maybe not the technically the rarest, but the one that's most wanted. And among 90s monster toys, I'm sure it's got to be up there near the top, if not at the top of the rarest, most sought after 90s monster toys. The 90s were not that long ago. I mean, they're getting farther and farther away, but we think of rare monster toys as being from the 60s or the 70s, maybe the 80s. We don't think of the 90s as producing a lot of really rare, valuable, sought-after monster toys, but there are a few, and this is one of them. I brought this out at the end of the Egyptian episode, and I don't remember how long, I think it was like about 20 minutes, of this particular item, which you're about to see. So this is a little, this clip's longer. It's not a little longer, it's a lot longer. But I hope you enjoy it and we'll, I'll, we'll talk afterward. Here it is. So let's get this out here again. Now, if, if you don't know what this is, then why did you want more mummy? I don't know. I think most people know what this is. This is a 21 inch tall. Telco Motionette licensed Universal Studios Boris Karloff Mummy. This is the Mummy Motionette. This is not the battery operated one. I think that's 16 inches tall. This is the 21 inch one that you plug into the wall. So this is a, a somewhat rare item. You could call this hard to find. And among Oceanettes, it, it's, it's probably the, the rarest, most desirable of all the Telco Motionettes. I mean, there are some really obscure variants. There are Telco Motionette collectors that are hardcore like that, and they may say that those variants are the rarest ones. But for most collectors, the, the holy grail of the Motionette collection is this mummy. So, um, I, I don't like to talk dollars and cents too much, but one of these sold in October of 2021 for $6,900. That's a lot of money. Uh, this one's not going anywhere. This one is mine. This stays with me. He's, I've had him on quite a, you know, quite a while, I guess, um, at least a decade. Um, a little, I think a little more than a decade. And uh, I got him in a, in a trade with a friend who was on the Universal Monster Army, and he's uh, still a viewer of this program. So I want to, I don't know if he wants to be named, but I want to tell him, I'm very grateful to this day for that trade. And this is not a commodity to me. This is something that is very meaningful to me and it is not going to leave my collection. At least not anytime soon. I don't know 10, 20 years from now when I'm on my deathbed or whatever, but it's not leaving me anytime soon. So, uh, but this is a, a very special item. Uh, this was made in 1994. And I've seen online, some people say 91 or 92. I don't know where they're getting that. Uh, maybe is there, I mean, it says 90. Well, the, well, I'll talk about the box in a minute. This particular box is 92, so I guess that's where they're getting it. But uh, these motion nets were produced, the first series uh, of the Universal, not the generic ones. I, I better back up a little bit. So I'm, I'm like in the presence of a celebrity with this mummy. 
I'm, I'm like tongue tied around this mummy. Telco made the motionettes uh, beginning in, I think, 1987 with the generic unlicensed Halloween motionettes. And they continued all through the 80s, all kinds of different variants and different characters, all generic, until 1993 when Telco put out some licensed Universal Studios monsters motionettes. They did Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman, and the Creature from the Black Lagoon in 1993. In 1994, they added The Bride of Frankenstein and The Mummy. And they did two sizes. They did uh, this big size and they did a smaller battery operated size. And they did some shaking heads or just like a head with like a little apron underneath and it shakes. Uh, so I know for sure this mummy is 1994. And so if you see it online, someone's saying it's 91, 92, 92 that's not right. It's 94 and uh, that comes direct from one of the vice presidents of Telco, who I interviewed in 1993 for a magazine article. And he sent me all of their catalogs from, from the beginning. And he, we talked at length about the whole history of the company, everything they put out. And the first year, and one of the reasons we were doing the article that year was because they were, had this new universal license. And that was the inaugural year for the universal motionettes. And then we talked again in 1994, and he sent me a new catalog for that year, uh, where I did a follow-up, a short little follow-up article about the bride and mummy motionettes. So it was direct from the horse's mouth. The, the mummy came out in 94. So if you see any different date, it's not right. Now this box is not the box this mummy originally came in. Uh, this box was found, this mummy was found, I think, in um, a thrift store or something like that. Uh, it was found in the wild, uh, but it didn't have its box. So the, the person who traded this to me included this, this box, which was originally for a wolfman, a universal wolfman. So this isn't the box that the mummy originally came in. Now... There's no difference in, well, in anything, really. Uh, but definitely there's no difference in anything on the front of the box between the mummy's box and the wolfman's box. They all had generic, the same boxes. All the characters in the set came in the same box. They did, Telco did make a, and I don't know if the camera will pick this up or not, but Telco did make uh, a variation of the side here with uh, with all these different universal motionettes pictured. This box only shows the uh, Dracula, Wolfman, Creature, Frankenstein. There, There is another version of the box that includes the mummy and the bride on the side where these pictures are smaller and the there's uh, three rows and the bottom row is bride and mummy. However, um, oh, and, and this little, this little barcode is the only thing that's different from one character to the next. So this barcode does have a unique number. It's a sticker. It's not printed on the box. It's a sticker. And this is the only th thing that differentiates one character from another because the the number on the barcode is specific to a character. And this number on this barcode, it's specific to the Wolfman. It's the Wolfman's barcode number on that sticker. In 2000, I talked to a, a collector who sent me pictures of his original boxed mummy that he bought back in the day. And it was 2000 at that point. That it was only a few years after we, they were in stores. And he still had his original box for his original mummy. And it was this box with the four, the four characters on the side. And he sent me a picture of the barcode which had the mummy's number on it. So it was definitely the mummy's box. So Telco packaged the mummy in this style box with the four characters on the side. I'm sure they also picture, 
packaged him in the box with the six characters as well. I would assume, but I know he did come in this, at least that example, a genuine verified example bought in the, in the 90s from the original owner had the mummy in the box with the four characters on the side and the sticker on the back was the mummy's barcode number. So that's a long-winded way of just trying to talk about this box, but I will, because it's not the original box, I, I don't want to mislead you and confuse you. I want, I want you to, to know what you're looking at. So that's some context for the box. <coughs> so let's, let's open him. I think I will open him off camera because I'm going to take great care in opening him. He was originally purchased at Frank's Nursery, $49.99. And interestingly, that's where I bought several of my Universal Motionettes. I bought them at Frank's Nursery. I bought the big uh, Universal Frankenstein, Dracula, and Wolfman at Frank's Nursery. And then I, I got my creature somewhere else. Creature from the Black Lagoon, and then I, I got this mummy in a trade. And I don't have a big Bride of Frankenstein. At one time, she was very gettable, the big bride. I have the little bride, but I don't have the big one. At one time, she was really not that hard to, to find, but now she's almost as hard to find as the mummy, the big one. Uh, and she goes for a lot of money. She, now the bride is going for thousands of dollars. I remember you could have bought one easily for, I don't know, four or $500, which is still a lot of money, but it's not thousands of dollars. I, obviously, I should have bought one then, but uh, I didn't like her. She had, like, big Tina Turner, like a troll doll, like a poofy kind of hair, and it just, eh, no, I wasn't too keen on, on her. Uh, but this mummy was never easy to find. Uh, when it was brand new, it wasn't easy to find. But I'll talk some more. Let's get this mummy out of the box. So we'll, we will uh, do another snap. It's like, like Thanos. So we'll do another snap. And when, after the blip, mummy will be magically out of the box. Here we go. Here we are. And the mummy is out of his package. So here is this lovely Boris Karloff mummy. And you can see he is a beautiful likeness of Boris Karloff. And the, the colors on this thing, they, they look a lot like the famous 1930s one sheet for the original Universal film. And, and this is not it. This is a real art. Well, it's not even that. It's a... <laughs> It's a bad reproduction of a real art uh, re-release of the mummy. So this is not the famous um, poster uh, of the mummy, but there's a couple of really great original 1930s Universal Studios one sheets for the mummy that have very, very vibrant colors. And uh, the, the color on this motionette seems like it's inspired by the color on those posters. So here he is. Uh, I guess we need to turn him on. No, he hasn't been operated since I first got him. So it's been, oh gosh, a, a good decade since I've turned him on. So I don't know if he works. He might not. And I'm concerned about damaging him. He's fragile. Um, <coughs> Okay, well, let's let's take a chance here and turn him on, see what happens. Hopefully his arms don't pop off or something. Here we go. Okay, that, hold on. Ah, this isn't the, this is not the button that turns on, it's down here on the, on the uh, electrical cable. This is just for the sound. Okay, so let's try this again. Oh my 
goodness. sound off. Okay. <laughs> I was like sweating bullets like ah, I don't break. Okay. Well, I almost sound like uh, like a Batman Joker kind of laugh. <laughs> now it's my understanding that there are different sounds that these things make, and 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 they don't all make the same sound. Um, I think some of them have a more realistic laugh. Maybe I don't think by the time they got to these, I don't think they made the electronic. <laughs> That fem, I still have my cold, so it can't quite get that high pitched squeal just right. But you know what I'm talking about the motion that's um, had that s electronic, s I don't know what you call it, it's a screechy sort of almost like a broken theremin going up and down, up and down. Those tonalities just. <laughs> And then they changed it to a laugh, but I, I think there's another version that has a more realistic laugh. I'm not sure, but I do know that they don't all make the same sound. That I have heard that uh, with this universal line, including the mummy, that they they don't necessarily make the same. Two of them won't necessarily make the same sound. But you just heard which one this, which sound this makes. So uh, I'll turn them on again in a second and get some close-ups. Um, but you just saw him operate. That's that's a rare sight. This it's rare to see this at all. Rare to see it operating. And I didn't know it. when I turned that button and nothing happened. I thought, you know, that's the way it is with mechanical toys. Sometimes they just stop working, particularly if you don't. Uh, use them. Like, I've got a bunch of Marx robots, uh, like the Frankenstein, the Yeti, the Kong, the tree, all that this kind of stuff. And I don't, I don't operate those those things. They haven't been they haven't moved since the '90s when I got them. So they probably don't work anymore. I don't know. I don't really care. I mean, I, I don't. I'd rather keep them preserved. <laughs> and not wear them out. This mummy is pretty much the end of the line for the big telco motion nets. They did make a a few more uh, sort of re rebooted versions of the generic motion nets, like a, I think a witch or something, in the 90s after this, and they made some smaller ones. I think um, like there's a, a little Grim Reaper and I don't know what else. I I stopped paying attention after after this, but but the classic big motion nets had pretty much run their course by the time they got to the Universal line. This is the like the grand finale of the uh, of the big motion nets. My interest in the motion nets pretty much ends with this Universal line. I I prefer generally the um, generic motion nets in the orange boxes. I think most collectors do, but uh, I, I do like the Universal ones too, uh, and certainly I, I love this mummy. This is the the star of, by far, the star of the Universal line. Most of them are very generic looking. The creature is pretty cool. I, I really like the big creature, uh, but none of them come close to the mummy. They they really knocked it out of the park with this mummy and put a lot of love into this mummy that. For some reason, they they didn't put into the 
the Dracula or the Frankenstein or whatever the bride. Maybe it was style guide situation that they weren't allowed to, but s somehow they were allowed to produce this amazing, vivid, obviously Boris Karloff mummy. And I don't know why Frankenstein couldn't be Boris Karloff. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Frankenstein's very generic looking. But this is an anomaly. This mummy. It, it stands alone. As really the only, not just the Universal series, but the entire Motion Net line from the '80s to the '90s, the only realistic looking actor likeness of the entire line. I mean, you could say that uh, like the um, earlier Phantom of the Opera is inspired by Lon Chini Sr.'s Phantom, but it's not a likeness. This is a likeness, and a really good one. If this were an action figure head, you would say that's a really good likeness. Um, the proportions are a little exaggerated, given the format, but uh, it's basically, I mean, it's one of the better Karloff mummy likenesses out there. It's really good. I think it's one of the better mummy toys, if you want to call it a toy. It's one of the better mummy toys ever made, as far as like a licensed mummy, a universal mummy. It's really the, the star of the Telco Motion Nets. And uh, it's rare because they didn't make very many. The, the guy from Telco that I interviewed in the 90s, he said that uh, he, he couldn't give me an exact number, but it was in the three digits. So they made m much less than a thousand of these. How many, I don't know, but it was in the hundreds, not the thousands. And most of the other ones, if for all the other ones, they made some quantity of thousands of them, of each character. This one, they made fewer than a thousand. How many exactly? I don't, he didn't give me a, a specific number, just that it was in the hundreds, not, not in the thousands. And he, I, he was a little confusing. And it, on one point, it seemed like he was telling me that there was one retail order, like a bookstore, a chain of bookstores, that ordered, and that was the only reason they even produced it, because they got one retail order for it, otherwise it wouldn't exist at all, just the prototypes. But he was a little, a little vague on, on that point. But uh, as I understood what he was saying, there, there, there was... The only reason we even had it in the first place was that there was one chain of bookstores that placed a, a retail order for this, and that's why they produced it, to fill that order for that bookstore chain. Now, I, I'm not saying that there, there weren't other retails that may have had one of these. If someone says, oh, I saw this at a Frank's nursery, or I saw it here, I saw it there, well, maybe you did. I'm just telling you what I found out in this interview with this vice president at Telco, uh, and, and he was a little vague on some points, like that one, about he didn't want to say exactly how many they made. And remember, when I was having this interview, this part two of this interview was in 1994. This was brand new. This was brand new. So he didn't want to put it down. He didn't want to... You know, give people a reason to not buy it, to like, oh, nobody wants that. No one's even ordering it. He, you know, he, didn't, he wasn't trying to uh, diss this product. He wanted to promote it. He wanted to pump it up. So that wasn't the time for like, straight talk about uh, how unpopular it was. He, he, was he, he had the opposite mission to try to promote these things and sell these things. So that's why there are not very many today. They didn't make very many in the first place. And it was probably very regional, uh, wherever this chain was. That's probably 
where you are mo most likely to find one. And if you didn't luck out and, and find one in 1994, October of 94, then you're out of luck. And this thing just never turns up, the 21-inch one. The small one is rare enough. I don't have a small one. The battery-operated mummy, I'd like to. Uh, but I mean, I th he's cute too, the little one. He's very cute in his own way. Uh, and I'd like to have one of those, but I don't. And he's rare, and he's getting up there. Um, for a long time, he was like three to $500. But now he's getting up into the $1,000 range. So I hope I do get one of the small mummies in the next couple of years. I would like to have one in my collection. But, you know, if I never do, that's fine, because I've got the big mummy. Most people, if they've got one or the other, they've got the small one. I can count on one hand the number of 21-inch mummies that I know about. Uh, I mean, I, I, there are many more Tomlin glow in the mummies, you know, the 8-inch Miko-style mummy. There's many more of those that I know of than these. Um, I mean, there's many more uh, carded Azurite can creatures than than these. So you just you go down the the list of rare monster items. There's more of them than there are of these. There are more haunted hulks <laughs> than there are these. And Haunted Hulk isn't a green guy, it's a pirate ship. A pirate ship with monsters on it. I mean, you name it, there's there's more of several of these very rare monster items that people talk about. There's more of those out there that I know of than these. These are very rare. So, I don't know what more I can show you as far as rare, beautiful monster toys besides this movie. This is one of the pinnacles of monster collecting. It's more recent. It's not like a 60s or a 70s thing like you might think. It's kind of unique in that regard that it is a more recent item. And yet, I do think it is certainly on the level of the very rare holy grails of the 60s or the 70s. It's definitely easily in that league with some of that older stuff. Well, I'm just kind of babbling now, so I think it's time to maybe show you a little bit more of this mummy moving. So, so let's, let's have a little bit more uh, m mummy motion. <laughs> Okay, have you had your fill of this mummy? Okay, you can't say I want more mummy because we're not doing that again. Okay, well let's go back, go back in time to the Kanal Kalili mummies and then I will say goodbye 
from that world, the world of the Egyptian mummies that we were in a few minutes ago. Let's go back there and then I will, from there, I will wrap it up. Okay, here we go. We won't snap. We'll, we'll use magic, the, the magic of Egypt, of the pharaohs. We'll, we'll use magic to go back to the Kanakalili mummies. And we're back. We are magically back. We have returned to the land of the mummies of Kanal Kalili. I hope you like that. Halloween was a few weeks ago now. This is Thanksgiving. But maybe that brought you back to Halloween for just a minute. Those Telco mummies, the big one like you just saw, they, they, there were two of them that surfaced um, this Halloween season on eBay. And both of them sold for thousands. So it's still commanding uh, a high price. Uh, the demand hasn't calmed down. And I'm very happy that I, I have that particular mummy. And I'm, I'm, as I said in that episode, I'm very grateful to the person who traded me that mummy. And it's an important piece in my collection. I'm glad I have it. So those are all the clips. I just want to show you those two. Go back and watch, if you haven't watched those episodes, go back and watch them. Watch the entire episode. And I think you might get something out of it. I hope you do. You might find it rewarding. I wanted to let you know, and I'm only using one camera for this, so I don't have a close-up, but consider subscribing to Toy Ventures, or I don't, you know, I don't know if you can do subscriptions. Consider purchasing, purchasing Toy Ventures. I've got a recurring, you could call it a column, it's not exactly a column, a recurring feature in this magazine and where is it? There it is. So this is the latest one. This is a feature on Loch Ness Monster collectibles and some childhood memories mixed in there. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. If you like this show, you might like that article. I've had uh, a feature in each of the last several issues of this so you could go back and get some back issues and I don't know if I'm going to continue to have a feature in every single issue but I'm sure I will have additional ones in the future so consider purchasing this magazine if you like this show you can get a little mini version of it in print every issue of this magazine and that's what I'm trying to do with those stories I'm trying to make them like this show but on paper so I, I, I mix a lot of personal stuff, personal memories, uh, combine that with information about toys and monster collectibles. That's it. Uh, have a happy Thanksgiving and have a happy holiday season. I will see you in a new episode this Saturday. Quite an episode to shoot, to, uh, not so much to shoot, but to edit. Uh, and the ending is, well, it's an in has an interesting ending. Not like the ones you just saw, but it does have an interesting ending. I don't want to say too much about it, but I'll be curious to see the responses from viewers, what they think about the way it ends. I think they'll have, I think they'll have some comments, maybe positive, maybe negative. Uh, I thought about just cutting the ending right out, but, I, but no, I, I don't know how flattering the ending is <laughs> or how satisfying it is to the viewer, but I said, no, I'm going to let it ride. I'm going to present it as it is and see what people think. So does that whet your appetite at all? I don't know, but watch the next episode, Basement of Horror, this Saturday, 
and I'll try to have a few more before the end of the year. Until next time, the one who dies with the most toys is dead.